welcome to Alaska Weather, a production of Alaska Public Media and the National Weather Service, Alaska Region. Produced and broadcast daily from the studios of KAKM, Alaska Weather provides complete forecasts, public, marine, and aviation for all of Alaska. Alaska Weather is made possible by the following sponsors. The National Weather Service. Good Tuesday, everyone. I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder with the National Weather Service. It is the 6th of October. As always, we encourage you to stay up to date with your local weather information, and you can do that easily online at weather.gov slash Alaska or arh.noaa.gov. The weather info line is always open for you at 800-472-0391, and you can find information all day long on Facebook, Twitter, and on YouTube. Of course, this week, the National Weather Service across the nation is talking about uh, did you know? Did you know little facts about the National Weather Service from things that keep us going to help us uh, on our mission to protect life and property around the country to the tools that we use and the ways that you can use those tools to stay better informed about your safety and the weather coming your way. So if you haven't checked out Facebook or Twitter in a while, make sure you do that sometime this week. Here's a look at the hazardous weather outlook now. As we look out towards St. Lawrence Island, you'll notice that's the only spot that's highlighted right now, and that is for a wind advisory that goes from 6 o'clock tonight until 6 o'clock in the morning. We're watching for some gusty northerly winds uh, coming in uh, from about 50 miles per hour. Uh, that will probably uh, blow a little bit of thing, a few things around across the island. That's really from the west to the eastern end, and really only for St. Lawrence Island as we go ahead. So watch out for some gusty winds for about the next 12 to 18 hours there again, uh, with the uh, winds up to about 50 miles per hour. Out across the western Pacific, another typhoon is sending a lot of moisture northward, but you'll notice the storm track, for the present moment anyway, has the jet stream winds blowing in at a west and northwesterly direction, so that is keeping a lot of that very heavy Pacific moisture from streaming northward into western Alaska, the Bering Sea, or really anywhere into the Gulf at this moment. Out across the northern Bering Sea, though, it's pretty easy to tell there's something else going on, and that is a potent area of low pressure that has a stronger southerly winds blowing toward Gamble and St. Lawrence Island at the moment. Watch the loop one more time, and you can see that it isn't really making a whole lot of progress in any one direction, but it does look like over the course of the next few days, it's going to retrograde or move backwards against the flow. Typically, weather moves from west to east across the northern hemisphere, and this particular low pressure system is going to back up just a little bit more and kind of move move against what we would consider a, a typical or normal uh, motion for a storm track. As we look at the rest of uh, Alaska, you can see that system out across the northern Bering, very close to Gamble and St. Lawrence Island, and with that, of course, we have those higher winds. Across the Gulf of Alaska, there's uh, plenty of scattered clouds across the region, but they're starting to organize a little bit more, a little bit further south of Kodiak, and that's along an area of low pressure and a frontal boundary that's working in from the south and east. So as that swings north and west, clouds are gathering along that. High pressure sitting across the southern Yukon at this point with a relatively clear sky, and that's keeping things fairly calm. Cool and dry for the Alcan border, especially south of Eagle and eastward. North of that, we have a weak frontal boundary, a stationary front that's locking in clouds from the Brooks Range east to west and allowing some low clouds and stratus to form across the coastal plain. For southeast, you've enjoyed a relatively dry day in many locations there, a few showers passing through in the northern end, but not really a whole lot to write home about for now. And most of the southern Bering Sea has enjoyed a little bit of a break in the cloud cover. There's still some pockets of marine fog and stratus there, but by and large, it has been a lot quieter on the southern Bering Sea than what we see north of the Pribilofs this afternoon. Here's a look at the surface chart now, and you can see that frontal boundary in the north. Uh, the storm system sitting across the northern Bering at 982 millibars and way out across the west, of course, we know that a lot of those clouds you see in the bottom left-hand corner are attributed to what we're seeing stream out and away from the typhoon in the western Pacific. Low pressure sitting in the central and southern Gulf with high pressure across the Alcan border, and we have a weak area of low pressure just west of the Queen Charlotte's and Haida Gwaii. Tonight's forecast shows low pressure south and west of St. Lawrence Island. Once again, this low is going to back up just a little bit more to the west. That should keep the west coast predominantly in that stronger southerly flow. That also means it's going to be warmer for you. As any precipitation creeps eastward into that cooler air mass, we'll see a lot of that evaporate probably as it moves eastward, but there might be an opportunity for a few snow showers or rain mixed with snow during the overnight hours. Most areas are going to be dealing with rain, though. 
You'll notice the southeast is still in a southeasterly flow. It's relatively light right now. That's going to switch around as we go into the coming days. Rain will form across the Kenai Peninsula. It's been gathering up for places like Kenai throughout the afternoon. That will continue working its way northward and spread into the Matanuska and Susitna Valleys as well as the Anchorage Bowl as we head into Wednesday. There may be some areas of light snow or rain showers mixed together across the uh, middle Yukon Valley and northward toward the Noatak and Kobuk Valleys and into the interior parts of the Seward Peninsula. But once again, with the warmer air in place across the western parts of Alaska, typically what we're going to be dealing with will be rain. Low pressure is still creeping westward just a little bit by tomorrow, and it's well west of St. Matthew by the afternoon at 987 millibars. As that moves westward, another wave develops just south of Akatan at 999 millibars, and it's accompanied by another area of low pressure across the western Gulf. This one's stronger at 977 millibars. It's pushing some drier air northward, but as that happens, it's also gathering some Pacific moisture and still sloshing that into the Gulf Coast from Kodiak Island to Prince William Sound and all the way into southeast where you'll start to see more showers north of the Dixon entrance. By Thursday, that's a better chance of rain for the north and eastern Gulf communities there, especially in southeastern Alaska. From Yakutat and westward, there's an opportunity for some heavier rainfall. And then more garden variety rain continues for especially the Prince William Sound side of the Kenai Peninsula parts of the Southern Cook Inlet and Kodiak Island. Colder air is going to try and drop southward. There's not a whole lot going on along that boundary just yet, but the further south it goes, we might have a better chance for some rain and snow in the higher terrain. North of that, it looks like some snow showers are still possible along the Brooks Range, though we might see a little more clearing across some parts of the Beaufort Sea Coast, and snow showers are possible north of the Bering Strait. Rain and a drizzle probably happening across the central and western chain as we get into Thursday, and we'll be watching for some areas of fog across the Pribilovs and northward into the Bering Sea. Temperature-wise today, we saw highs in the upper 40s and lower 50s for a large part of southeast after, again, another fairly dry day for many locations there. Mid-50s as we get into Haines and Skagway to Juneau, 54 around Sitka, mid-50s around the Dixon entrance, including Klawak and Craig and eastward into Petersburg. 61 with the temperature today around Hyder. Look like uh, 51 in Yakutat, upper 40s to about 50 around uh, Cordova to Valdez, a little bit cooler to the west around Seward and Portage with Homer at 47. Kenai, wetter and 44. And Anchorage saw 46 today. Talkeetna, a place to be at 52 degrees this afternoon. Healy, 48 with Fort Greeley at 47. Uh, Northway had 47 with uh, Fairbanks checking in at 46 degrees. 45 in Eagle. Fort Yukon checked in at 36 with Anaktuvik Pass and Arctic Village both at 27 degrees. The Arctic coast east of Wainwright saw temperatures in the mid to upper 20s with Kaktovik at 29 degrees. Uh, south of Wainwright, we saw temperatures warming into the lower to mid 30s. Kivalina had 44, Kotzebue 43, Shishmaref 45, about the same on the other side of the peninsula at Nome. Tin City, breezy and 47, some stronger gusts there. And for St. Lawrence Island today, 43 degrees there around Gamble. Bethel had 49 degrees. Unalakleet was in the mid, fifth, uh, mid 40s, I should say. McGrath was 44 degrees. And a little bit further south into Bristol Bay, we saw highs in the lower 50s there. Most of the Alaska Peninsula was very close to 50 degrees. Sand Point a little bit milder at 52. Uh, mid to upper 40s for most of the Pribilof Island locations, 49 around St. Paul, and lower 50s for Adak and Atka, and 50 in Shemi this afternoon. Now, overnight lows will be a little bit cool across the north and eastern Brooks Range. Teens and 20s there for the Arctic coast as well, just shy of 40 around Nome. Southwest Alaska, likely in the mid to upper 30s, even inland locations there on the milder side, thanks to that south wind. 44 in Kodiak and low 40s for the chain and the peninsula, with southeast in the upper 30s in the north and mid to upper 40s in the south, south central, looking at overnight low temperatures just above freezing. Look for most areas in south central tomorrow to be just shy of 50 degrees. Kodiak and Homer probably closer to that mark with upper 40s for south and western Alaska, Bristol Bay and most of the peninsula as well as the chain. Look for highs in the 50s for southeast. The interior, including the middle Tanana Valley, will only see highs in the lower 40s with the north slope and the Arctic coast in the upper 20s to about 30 degrees for some of the higher terrain. Flying weather shows MVFR conditions for the north and most of Kotzebue Sound, as well as areas around St. Lawrence Island. As you get out into the Gulf, expect a wide area of IFR generally east of Kodiak Island and also along the western edge of the uh, Susitna, uh, the Susitna's uh, Talkeetna Range and the Alaska Range and parts of the Chugach, especially on the eastern side of the divide there. 
watch for Anaktuvik to look for VFR conditions throughout the day. Same goes for Anaktuvik Pass, or Adigan Pass, I should say. Things look pretty good there. For Lake Clark and Merrill Pass, though, a different story as you just saw on the map. Look for increasing areas of IFR conditions, especially on the western side. Rainy Pass looking for IFR conditions to develop, with rain moving in from the south. Windy Pass should lean over toward IFR fairly quickly in the day, and Isabel Pass, we expect to see instrument flight rule by day's end. Mentasta Pass right now looks pretty good. VFR conditions expected at this point, and Tanita Pass will likely lean over toward IFR after an MVFR start, again, thanks to wetter weather moving in. Portage Pass should see IFR conditions throughout the day after lowered visibility early in the day, and Chilkoot and White Pass likely holding at VFR conditions through most of your Wednesday. Freezing levels are showing a shift to the east. The surface freezing line now kind of uh, moving a little bit eastward as low pressure backs up a little bit, but the warmest air loft is still over the central and eastern Gulf and southeastern Alaska, where levels range from 6 to about 10,000 feet. For most of interior Alaska, you can see uh, 2,000 to 4,000 foot freezing levels, and then north of the Yukon, those levels drop from about uh, the surface to uh, 2,000 feet in rapid succession. Uh, the ice and potential is still light to isolated moderate in any of the areas you see, and some of that's still fairly high up there, above four to 5,000 feet across a few pockets there for the western tip of western Alaska, as well as the middle Yukon Valley, and then areas in long and west of the Susitna Valley, above six to about 10,000 feet all the way on over Kodiak Island, and then gathering along that frontal boundary, working northward across the Gulf of Alaska. As far as the jet stream goes, the main pattern right now is coming out of the west and northwest, and that is keeping that moisture from the typhoon we just saw across the western Pacific from really reaching into any part of Alaska. So this entire pattern would have to take more of a southwesterly flow. Right now, that's not the case. We have that southwesterly or northwesterly shift driving southward, and with that, that's pushing all the moisture eastward. So if it's going to go anywhere, it looks like the Pacific Northwest. In fact, this pattern right now is guiding a hurricane's moisture that's uh, just east and north of Hawaii a lot closer uh, to a track that would take it into the Pacific Northwest. So really interesting and fascinating system to watch because it just doesn't happen that much. As we look at the 9,000 foot winds, you can see low pressure across the western Gulf as well as the northwestern Bering. All of this is driving in southeasterly winds across south central Alaska with a northwesterly flow coming across the north slope, 10 to 20 knot winds there, and southerlies across the eastern Gulf at 20 to 40 knots, and west and northwesterly winds a little bit stronger for the central and western chain from about 30 to as high as 55 knots. At 3,000 feet, a very similar pattern here. You can see this kind of dual dumbbell shape with southeasterly winds moving across the Gulf, more of a southeasterly flow across southwestern Alaska, and offshore winds blowing off of of the northwestern coast. North and westerly winds coming across the central and western chain and for southeastern Alaska you can see that broad southerly flow coming up from about 20 to 30 knots there running parallel to the coastline. So as far as turbulence goes it's really going to be the places that stick out into that flow a little bit more and generally low below 4,000 feet here across the northern gulf through the barrens there and as we get into Thursday the areas of turbulence are really going to pick up with a strong northeasterly wind coming right down Cook Inlet through Shelikoff Strait. Watch for those winds in the marine forecast in a bit. Across the northwestern coast, below 4,000 feet for the Chukchi Sea areas, as well as areas in the northern bearing, and then for the central and western chain, below 4,000 feet. Most of that, again, light to isolated moderate. That's a look at your aviation forecast. I'll be back with the rest of your marine weather and an update on the sea ice edge here in just a few minutes. Stay tuned. Welcome back to another edition of Alaska Weather Facts. I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder. As you well know, you can get forecast information for any day of the week. Today, tonight, tomorrow, out to six or seven days. It includes the high and low temperature, the wind direction, the chance of rain or snow in your part of Alaska. But did you know that there is information available to forecast out to two weeks? So the question is, how would you use that information? And here to answer that question today and tell us a lot more about climate services from the U.S. National Weather Service Alaska region is Rick Toman. He is the program manager for the Climate Science and Services. And uh, Rick, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Dave. How would we use information that is out to two weeks instead of just the high and low and the chance of rain? Well, Dave, as we move out in time, of course, uh, forecasts become more uncertain so as we move into that second week from now, we're not looking at specific uh, highs or lows or precipitation amounts at any given place. Uh, what we can do with the state of the science at this point is get a handle on patterns. Uh, so we can uh, say things like 
um, increased chances for uh, stormy weather in the Bering Sea uh, in two weeks. Or we've been in a cold weather pattern, looks like uh, eight to ten days from now, that pattern's going to change. Those are the kind of forecasts uh, that we can currently make in that second week. So you're increasing lead time for perhaps big or small weather events and telling us the likelihood of uh, maybe uh, more coastal storms or wind events in some areas? Uh, those are the kinds of things that, um, that we hope to be able to, to let Alaskans know in the, in the second week forecast. And if you have an activity or an event that you would find that kind of advance notice useful, whether it's moving stuff off of the beach, whether to go out hunting or to come back from camp, those kind of decisions, the week two uh, provides uh, the opportunity uh, for you to get a handle on that kind of information. Okay. What other type of weather impacts that we're familiar with might Alaskans use climate services for? Well, in the forecast realm, we can go uh, provide some information from this uh, week two, say the eight to 14 day period, uh, on out uh, to the uh, monthly and even seasonal time scale. Now, those monthly seasonal forecasts are still kind of uh, just really very much pattern dependent and the amount of detail that we can provide at this point is still uh, pretty limited generally uh, indications of how temperature and precipitation will fall in, in uh, maybe above normal, below normal kind of range. Uh, but in the week two period, uh, we can uh, be considerably more specific than that as far as the general patterns and the really the impacts on Alaskans. Okay, so we would be talking about generalizations there that would, would tell us that the, the period might be more stormy, might be more hot, more dry, more cold, and th situations like that. That's correct. So we're not going to be able to say in which community, uh, for instance, there's the threat of coastal flooding, but we can, we'll, can often be able to tell we're moving into a pattern that would be conducive to big Bering Sea storms. So if you're in an area that that could potentially uh, impact you, you'll want to pay attention uh, to uh, the weather forecast. Okay. Now, every day and every hour of the day, the National Weather Service is working on a forecast for the next day. But how do you start your forecast process for that extended period that goes out beyond seven days? Well, the way things work right now, we start off with the expected general flow pattern uh, for a Alaska and, and the whole world really, we, and then we narrow that down to Alaska. So we start off with the basic computer model forecast. There's uh, quite a few different computer models that we look at, bring those together. And then another important part of that is we as attempt to assess the confidence. Um, the reality is often two weeks away, the computer models are very divergent. They have lots of different solutions. And that's an indication that we don't have much confidence. Uh, but when we see uh, more agreement in that time frame, and when that agreement is a pattern that will be potentially very impactful for Alaska or is a big change from what we've been in, that's when we can then take that expected pattern, we have computer models forecasting it, we've assessed the confidence, now we can move that forward. How, using our experience as Alaskan weather forecasters, how does that uh, typically play out for Alaska? So is this a stormy pattern for the Bering Sea? Is this a, an extra rainy period for Southeast? Is this the kind of pattern that generates uh, strong winds potentially in, in the Anchorage Bowl? Is this a deep cold pattern for the interior? All of those are the kind of things that we're looking at in these large scale patterns. That's very different than telling you that the winds on 10 days from now are gonna be gusting to 120 on the hillside. We're looking for patterns, not, um, not the very specific information that the Weather Service will then hone in on as the event gets closer. So the idea is to keep the five, six, seven day forecast the same where you are getting the standard high and low temperature and the chance of wind or rain, but further out you get a broad general forecast, but as the time gets closer to that event, we'll get a lot more specific. That's correct. Okay, very good. So how can people use this information if I am out in the bush and I want to see is a coastal storm expected in my region or is a chance for that improving? over the next uh, two to three weeks. Where could I go to get information like that? When we see that uh, potentially impactful or a big change in the weather is coming uh, eight to 14 days out, uh, typically we will 
uh, start to highlight that on uh, the Weather Service Facebook site. Um, we might produce a YouTube video uh, highlighting that, linking that on our Facebook site. Um, so often we don't, at this point, we don't have much to say in that because we're really looking for those forecasts of opportunities. But one thing we can say very likely as uh, we go through the next uh, two or three years, there'll be more and more of this kind of forecast information available in that week two time frame. Okay, and something that emergency managers and city planners and uh, folks in villages might be interested in keeping an eye out for, uh, looking for that information to be headlined, uh, whether that's on social media or perhaps uh, through uh, uh, the National Weather Service channels there to get information from, like, uh, from you to make better plans a little bit uh, longer term and make uh, better preparations in the event that things become a little bit more unsettled. Uh, absolutely. Uh, uh, Climate Services uh, with the National Weather Service of Alaska Region is talking to uh, the state of Alaska every week, uh, apprising them of uh, that uh, two-week outlook. And, um, and uh, on the social media side, uh, we uh, are working to uh, keep Alaskans informed so that when we think we have uh, some confidence in a high impact or a big change, mm -hmm. to, uh, that's the best way right now for folks to uh, find out about that, uh, Twitter, uh, Facebook. So uh, uh, stay tuned to uh, your National Weather Service. Very good, a developing program. Rick Toman with the National Weather Service Alaska Region. He's a Climate Science and Services Program Manager. Thanks so much for joining us again, Rick, and hope to have you back again soon. Great, thanks, Dave. For another edition of Alaska Weather Facts, I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder. We'll see you next time. Sea surface temperatures are affected by wind, of course, and the amount of sunlight that we're receiving on Earth. As a result, a southerly flow up the western coast is keeping things pretty warm and above freezing. But that's not the case in the Beaufort Sea, where temperatures are still holding at or even below freezing there. As a result, we continue to see more ice there along the coast and certainly offshore, where temperatures are even colder. Here's a look at the ice edge as analyzed today by Alaska sea ice experts, weather.gov slash anchorage slash ice dot php. You'll probably notice some things have changed there a little bit more as we have adapted to a different standard for analyzing the ice. In the areas shaded in blue, these are regions that are about 20 to 80 percent concentration, the areas in white 80 or above, and that goes for areas along the Arctic coast as well. You can see that is starting to fill in just a little bit more, especially for areas east of Barrow there and uh, into uh, some of the, the bays. Uh, the concentrations there are increasing, uh, probably in some part to a little more fresh water in some of those places there from seasonal runoff. And that, of course, is easier to freeze up a little bit faster. So as we track changes there, you'll find out uh, more information on our webpage, of course, and you can always check the five-day forecast there as well for the ice outlook. For southeast now, you're looking at northerly winds across Lynn Canal at 15 knots with three-foot seas for tomorrow, a little bit stronger across the Clearance Strait up to 25 knots. And southeasterly is coming up the outer coast from about 30 to 35 knots with nine to uh, eight foot seas in the north there as you head into Wednesday afternoon. Now winds will strengthen on Thursday as that front lifts a little bit further north and east coming out of the low pressure system working northward toward Kodiak. You can see winds up to high gales there, 40 to 45 knots, 14 to 15 foot seas in some of the stronger areas there. Northerly is coming out of the Lynn Canal, northeasterly is cutting across Stevens Passage, and some of the stronger southeasterly is coming into gales for Clarence Strait as well with an eight foot sea on Thursday. Northeasterlies will build along Cook Inlet and into Shelikoff Strait on Wednesday. This isn't the big day, though. Uh, we'll see winds from 20 to about 35 knots to just west of the Barrens, and east and northeasterly winds across the north and western Gulf, uh, 7 to 10 foot seas there in some of the higher seas, and 4 foot seas inside of Prince William Sound. Thursday looks even stronger. Look at these winds coming in from the north to northeast, and once they run from the north and east, coming down Cook Inlet, especially south of Calgan Island to Shelikoff Strait, that's a pretty good fetch there for Shelikoff. That means 23 foot seas there, so going across in the ferries, uh, might want to a few extra pills of Dramamine there. Northeasterly is across Prince William Sound and easterly is across the Western Gulf, 35 to 40 knots with 15 to 16 foot seas just east of the Barren Islands. So again, the wind's coming up on Thursday in South Central. For the Alaska Peninsula, northerly is across Bristol Bay at 15 knots, eight foot seas a little bit further down the coast and north and northwesterly winds from Castle Cape all the way down to Sand Point and King Cove, 20 to 25 knots with a six foot sea on Wednesday and northeasterly is coming offshore uh, for Bristol Bay on Thursday, eight foot is expected there. Northerlies as you head uh, down the coastline with an 11 foot sea, otherwise 30 knot winds for the Pacific coast and 11 to 13 foot seas there on Thursday. 
For the Aleutians, northwesterlies in the western part of the chain, 30 to 35 knots with 14 to 15 foot seas. Otherwise, north and westerly winds for the central and eastern chain. A little bit more of a southwesterly flow north of Unalaska with a 9 foot sea on Wednesday. As we get into Thursday, northwesterly winds for the central and eastern chain, 15 to as high as 30 knots, a little bit slower there between Nikolsky and Atka with 9 to 10 foot seas. North and westerlies for the areas from Kiska to Attu with 13 to 16 foot seas. And again, some uh, 30 to 35 knot winds there across the west for Thursday. Not a big change for you. Southerlies on the west coast and for the Pribilops for Wednesday, most areas looking at 15 to 20 knots with 9 to as high as 11 foot seas. And Thursday, a different uh, sort of uh, animal there with north and easterly winds developing, 25 to 30 knots. Northeasterlies from St. Lawrence Island all the way down to Nunavak Island. Northerlies for St. Paul and St. George with an 8-foot sea. You will notice that as that blows through, it will be colder. Easterlies coming across the Beaufort Sea with freezing spray, 15 to 20 knots, 3 to 4-foot seas there, an offshore wind from Wainwright southward, 25 to 35 knot winds expected there. For Thursday, 20 to 25 knot winds across the Beaufort Sea coast, again watching for freezing spray, and a northeasterly fetch running down the Chukchi Sea coast means 30 to 40 knot winds with 8 to 12-foot seas building in. And once again, freezing spray is a possibility with that flow. Northeasterly is outside of Kotzebue Sound as well with a 7-foot sea. Recapping tonight's weather, low pressure just west of St. Lawrence Island means that stronger southerly winds are possible. A wind advisory is posted for your region with gusts up to 50 miles per hour tonight starting from 6 o'clock in just a few minutes until 6 a.m. tomorrow. So if you've got some things laying around that you don't want to be blowing around or perhaps uh, the boats aren't tied down very well, you might want to check on that. A 983 millibar low will continue backing up a little bit more to the west and starting to fill in. Meanwhile, two other players show up on the map. Low pressure across the Central Gulf means a better chance for developing rain showers in southeast and stronger winds Wednesday into Thursday and a chance for rain across south central and western Alaska may mix in a little bit with snow tonight, but most likely rain for most of the west. That's your Alaska weather. We'll see you again tomorrow. These forecasts are to be used for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go flying. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbor master before you go boating. Alaska weather is made possible by the following sponsors. The National Weather Service. Indy Alaska is a groundbreaking series that dives into the lives of people living in the last frontier. Each episode introduces you to colorful characters from around the state. Funding for Indy Alaska is provided in part by Alieska Pipeline Service Company. Catch the latest episodes at alaskapublic.org.